baptized by John. But John tried to deter him saying, I need to be baptized by you. And, uh, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. And at that moment, heaven was opened and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and, and lighting on him. And a voice came from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. So there's our scripture for the evening, the baptism of Jesus. And there's, uh, there's a lot of good stuff here um, that we're going to get to. And I just want to kind of break it down here and, and just pick out some things that, that stood out to me when I was studying out this passage. Uh, we learned from the, the Gospel of Luke that Jesus is about 30, uh, Luke chapter 3 says, when he starts his ministry. And one thing I found to be interesting is, and we're going to share the screen here, is the, there we go. So in, um, in Numbers chapter 4, according to the Old Testament, if you were going to serve as a priest, you would have to be, the minimum age to do this would be age 30. So anyway, so if you go through Numbers chapter 4, Numbers chapter 4 is all about the Levites. And of course, the Levites are the ones that have the Levitical priesthood. And it goes through all the different clans of the Levites, and it keeps saying over and over again that they've got to be men from the age of 30 to 50. And so those were the requirements. So it makes sense that Jesus was, well, age 30 when he begins his public ministry. And then the scripture says uh, that, that the, the heavens open and the spirit descends like a dove. And, uh, and dove, uh, sorry about that. The, uh, the dove was always like the sign of innocence. In fact, even in Matthew, he sends them out and he says, be as shrewd as snakes, but as innocent as doves. And so here you have this innocent spirit, if you will, like there's nothing more clean or more innocent than the Holy Spirit. In fact, doves were things that if you were poor and you didn't have a lamb to sacrifice in the Old Testament, you could sacrifice uh, a couple of doves instead. And so they were this mark of, of being pure. And then, the, and then it says here that the spirit comes down and it says it, it lights him. And I looked that up a little bit because that stood out to me. But basically it just means it, it came upon him. And we go to Isaiah chapter 11 in verse one. Oh, this is tricky because you guys are in the way. Okay, there we go. Isaiah 11 verse one. It's the whole chapter is actually about Jesus. And, and listen to what it says. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse from his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, just like it's doing here through the dove. Um, the, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, he will delight in the fear of the Lord. So again, if you read through all of Isaiah chapter 11, the entire chapter is devoted to Jesus. And then there's another chapter in Isaiah, it's Isaiah 42. And what's it say? It says, it's another huge chunk of scripture. It's not the entire chapter, but it's all about Jesus. And how does it start off again? It says, here's my servant, uh, here's my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. Again, just more of the same here. Lots and lots of um, allusions here to, to Jesus. Jesus is, this is, is the Messiah. Again, it's Matthew, and it's, he's speaking to the Jews, and he's saying, look, look in your own book. This is the Messiah. The Spirit has come and rest on him. He's hammering this home again and again and again. The Old Testament fulfillment of prophecy is in Jesus. And then he gets to these great words. It says, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And that's actually where I want to spend the majority of our evening tonight. Um, actually, it sounds a lot like a passage that we just looked at in Isaiah 42. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. Again, very similar kind of words here that Isaiah 42 kind of goes along with this. But one of the things that grabbed my attention is that Jesus hears from God it's more than just Jesus. It's the crowd that's with Jesus. They hear from God only two different times in the New Testament. The first one's here at his baptism, and the second time is at the Mount of Transfiguration. And when you know, what does he have to say at the, at the, oops, I put the dove on the wrong slide. Whoops. 
All right, I need some editing here. But what do you know in Matthew chapter 17, verse 5? I was wondering where that dove went. It says, while he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. Isn't it interesting? Let me see if I can unshare this now. Stop share. Hey, I'm back. Isn't it interesting that the two times, I mean, God only speaks twice in the New Testament, twice during the ministry of Jesus, like in this audible voice, and he says virtually the exact same thing both times, which made me pause and go, oh, wait a second, what is it? Like, this must be pretty important for Jesus to be communicating. If this is the, if, he's, if he only speaks twice and he says the same thing, this thing's got to be pretty important. And that's really what I want to look at here uh, this, uh, this evening is w the meaning and the power behind these words and how that actually kind of relates to us. And so, all right, I don't think I'm going to do these screen shares anymore. This is annoying. Okay, here we go. Uh, from current slide. All right, I got to get my flow down. So here's the questions we're going to ask here. Number one, what impact would these words have on, number one, his audience? Number two, what words would they have on Jesus? And number three, if you heard Jesus, or if you heard God, rather, say these words about you, what impact would they have on you? And so let's answer the first one qu quickly here. The, the audience, what impact would that have or would that make on his audience? Well, obviously, it would give him some serious backing. You know, if you heard the voice of God and they say, oh, yeah, this is the guy, this is my son whom I love. With him, I'm well pleased. Even in Matthew 17, it even ends with listen to him. That's, that's pretty powerful. I, I think that would probably, you know, help his, uh, his, uh, his street cred was at an all-time high after uh, hearing that. And, and that makes sense. But if we go to 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter even writes this and he says, he says, for we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we are with him on the sacred mountain. Okay, I think that's the end of my slides here for a little while, so you get me again. This moment, Peter was one that got to hear this at the Mount, uh, at the Mount of Transfiguration. And this had such a uh, profound impact on him that he writes about it in an epistle. And, you know, basically a generation has passed and, you know, the, the, naturally the rumors are starting to go, they're starting to develop. Well, is this all a made up story here? Is this, is this real? And Peter ad addresses this in the scriptures and says, oh no, this is real. This Jesus is real. And, and what's he do? Sure enough, he says, uh, you know, I was there, I heard him, I heard the audible voice. So what would this do for his audience? Again, this would give Jesus some serious street cred. Secondly, what would this do for Jesus? And this is kind of hard to answer because, you know, Jesus has got that kind of humanity and divinity going all in one. But I could just, I, I would venture to guess that this probably did a lot for his confidence. That if you heard God Almighty say this, you know, you wouldn't be walking into your ministry going, man, I, I hope I didn't sin back when I was 16. Like, oh man, I wonder if I really am this. This would put the stamp of approval. And, and I would imagine that Jesus, I'm sure he was already holding his head up high, but it just made him hold it up that much higher. You know, that feeling of, man, I'm, I'm the man here. Like God just gave me the stamp of approval. And he didn't do it in this private setting where only, a, you know, only he could hear it. You know, that would have been good. but. It's way cooler when somebody, it's, it's great when somebody says something nice about you. It's way cooler when somebody says something nice about you in the presence of other people. That's like even more encouraging. And, and it seems as though God is speaking not to Jesus, but to these other people like, hey, this is my son. You got to listen to him. And so I imagine Jesus's confidence was at an all time high. I don't know if it could dip at all, but if it did, you know, it, it, it would. And and I bet a lot of this Isaiah 42, Jesus not only knew the word, he was the word. I bet a lot of this was coming to his mind as he heard these words. But the real question I want to talk about here tonight is, what would it do for you? 
if you heard God say the words to you, this is Vince, whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. This is Sherman, who I love. This is Andre, whom I love. This is Dean. With, with Dean, I am well pleased. With Jackson, I am well pleased. With Corey, I am well pleased. If you heard those words come from the mouth of God, what would that do for your walk with him? What would that do for your confidence? How might that impact that? How might that impact your impact on the city of Cleveland? Because I can say for sure that that would have a profound impact on me. Uh, I would absolutely love to hear those words from you know come from the mouth of God. Like, okay, wow, all right, I am doing this right. Okay, I am okay. All right, let's get back out there. Let's do this again. That would impact me in a in a massive way. And one of the things I've learned, here we go, we're going to get a little open here. Now, one of the things that I've learned over the years, and I've never really wanted to admit it, but it's become increasingly clear, is that approval is very important to me. Approval is very important to me. And um, I, I've always known I'm kind of an insecure guy. I, I know that. And I kind of known that, that approval kind of is important to me. But I've started to kind of hone in on how important it is to me. And it's not necessarily a good thing. It's, it's not a good thing, but it's real. It's kind of where I am. And, and so I've been doing this like therapy stuff for my panic. And I've been meeting with a brother online. And uh, he's a therapist. And he's, he's kind of, he takes a, a, a very different approach to this whole thing. But one of the first things he said when we got together, he said, do you struggle with approval? And I said, yeah, I think I do. Maybe do a little degree. And then he had me do an exercise. And it became very clear that I absolutely do. It's, uh, um, yeah, anyway, so I do. And he said, there is a massive link to people who have panic attacks with, with people who are looking for approval, who don't feel like they have approval. And I, that made me stop in my tracks and go, really? And he said, oh, yeah, documented. I've never heard that before. And sure enough, it's very, very true. And I thought, well, that, that fits pretty well with me. And I, we started doing a lot of things. It was kind of interesting. And um, it, it, it's wild. And the person with the panic attack, approval means a lot. And not to go through this whole, you know, I'm going to skip some of this stuff. But basically, what I've learned is I care very much what certain people think of me. It's not everybody, but certain people, it, it matters a lot what they think about me. And somehow in this, this translates into public speaking and panic. And I don't know, the brain's really, really confusing. But, uh, but anyway, it's, it's made me look at he asked me a question about God and we got kind of deep theologically. And when he asked me the question, it, it hit me for so I don't think he meant for it to hit me as hard as it hit me, but he, he basically said, so what does God think of you? You know, and I gave him some of the, the, the right answers. Uh, but I also gave him some of the kind of the real answers. Like, well, this is kind of how I feel. I know what the scriptures say, but this is kind of how I feel. And the, the pivotal question he asked me is he said, so do you think that when you were in the womb, it's really a weird question. Do you think when you were in the womb that you were made in the image of God? And I stopped and I thought, well, yeah, I do. And he's like, well, what does that mean to you? I said, well, yes, it means he's pretty happy with me. You know, like, yeah. And warts and all, it doesn't matter. Like if I was made in the image of God, then I was made in the image of God. And somehow over the last month and just kind of chewing on that, and I've talked to a lot of brothers about it actually in fellowship and whatnot that we've had, but it's really kind of helped me to go, oh yeah, like me and God are cool. Like we're, we're good. Like he, he made me in it and it's good. And, I, and I've started kind of thinking on a deeper level how, as we were talking a lot about this whole kind of Eastern viewpoint versus a Western viewpoint, the Westernized view of Christianity, I actually think if we're, if we're not careful, we can actually let it destroy our self-image. And, and let me explain what I mean by that. That sounded kind of wild. But this view of Christianity, I think some of us, we allow it, and specifically this kind of total depravity type state. Total depravity is that you are, you know, it comes from this whole original sin. You are evil, wicked, terrible. You know, and there are scriptures to back this up. I'm not saying this is inaccurate. What I am saying, though, is that potentially it's, it's out of balance or it's out of proportion. Let me get back to this. We're descendants of Adam. 
Adam kind of ruined it all. And so we'll talk amongst each other that we are, un, we'll use words like we're unworthy, we're evil. Scriptures even say we're objects of wrath by nature. Like, oh, that's not super awesome. You know, even like the little bit of good that we do, do we're like filth, that's like filthy rags before the Lord. And, and again, I, I don't want to say that some of these concepts aren't true, but if that's your, if that's your main viewpoint, of what God thinks about humanity and therefore about you, it kind of takes this mindset of like, God is not well pleased with me. Like, and when we do sin, it's like, yep, there I go again. Like I'm, I get it. I'm this horrible sinner. And Christianity, if we're not careful, can have a very negative vibe to it. And I want to kind of offer us a different viewpoint here tonight. I don't know if different viewpoint differing viewpoint. I think all these things can kind of merge together. But I want to look at, how about we put it this way? Let's look at the opposite side of the coin. That yes, there's things and we're depraved and all that. And I'm just got a book. I'm going to read something about that. But there's a lot of scriptures that talk about the love of God and what God really truly thinks of us. And with that, I'm going to try to share my screen again. In Genesis chapter one, then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And for uh, technology's sake, I'm just going to go right to the next passage. Later down, I believe that's what, verse 31. It says, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. I'm back. So here we go. God keeps making things, right? And whose image are we made in? We're made in the image of God. And there's nothing in the scriptures that tells me after the fall that we've stopped being made in the image of God. And we might mess ourselves up and okay, but we were still, we were made in the image of God. And Genesis chapter one is a very encouraging passage about mankind. And it says, you know, God keeps making things after each day. It is good. Day two, it it was good. Day three, it was good. He adds man into the equation in day six, and it's a game changer. And it says it becomes very good. Like it just went up a notch. That adding mankind did something that nothing else could do. Adding some adding someone with the with that was made in the image of God was a game changer for God. All of a sudden now it was really, really good. And and, and so Yes, we can look at ourselves and have this really, really negative viewpoint of mankind and even ourselves. But I started thinking about some of the interactions that Jesus had with the people. And yet for every Pharisee that he rebukes and, you know, is trying to help them to see that they're not so good, he runs across a lot of other people. I mean, when he does his street preaching, he doesn't do it like the the old guys at Ohio State, that the crazy guys out there that would, you know, tell everybody they're going to hell. He told a Roman centurion, a guy that was not Jewish, therefore was in this like depraved state, that he'd never seen somebody with more faith. He used an example of a humble, sinful man who bows before on his knees to God, and he says, that's how we ought to pray. Like, that's the good guy here in this story. He He spoke positively about the Samaritans. He spoke positively about the tax collectors. He spoke positively about the prostitutes. When Jesus had the opportunity to address people, oftentimes he brought out the good in them and didn't concentrate on, oh, you're just an object of wrath. <laughs> that, wasn't, that wasn't like his emphasis when he spoke with people. And, and, and so again, kind of this, this idea here is, is if, we're, if we're not careful, some of us, I don't think all of us do this. I think some of us, we live in a Genesis 3 world And the Genesis 3 world is we relate to Adam, the sinner. And we're like, yep, we're awful. We're terrible. I think those folks ought to look more at the Genesis 1 and try to identify a little bit more with that. 
I do think there's others, though, that are more in the Genesis 1 camp, and they struggle with pride, and they're going, oh, yeah, I'm awesome. Well, amen, maybe you need to visit Genesis 3 and get a little wake-up call that, yeah, no, both of these things kind of exist. Um, you might be thinking, well, wait a second here, and I realize some of this might be, like, theologically concerning, and, and I'm not trying to make any kind of theological statements or anything like that. We are going to get to something that we completely agree with here. But uh, I, I do want to I do want to look at this passage, though, about the filthy rags, because I do think that gets thrown around a lot, and without the proper context, it gets thrown around where it shouldn't get thrown around. So I'm going to bring it up here again. And this is coming from um, Isaiah chapter 64. Isaiah chapter 64. It really would be helpful if you read the entire chapter, but we'll just read this a little bit. It says, all of us have become like the one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf. And like the wind, our sin sweeps us away. No one calls on your name or strives to lay hold of you. When he's saying this, he's actually including himself in this. And the context of this is Israel is a complete and total wasteland spiritually. I mean, they have sold out. They are worshiping Asherah poles. They're having sex in, in false gods' temples. I mean, they are, it's really, really, really bad. And what Isaiah is doing here is he's using simple hyperbole. Hyperbole just means exaggeration. What he's saying is, man, we are so bad. Like, we're so bad. Even if we did something good, it's a filthy rag. I don't think he's making a doctrinal statement about what our righteous, you know, what our righteous acts are really like. And, and I would point us to, to um, let's go to Psalm chapter 51. It, it's similar to this. Psalm 51 is where you get the whole doctrine of original sin in it. David writes, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Now, is this a literal statement that he was sinful at birth? I mean, some people would say yes. Um, did God really desire faithfulness from him even in the womb? How is that even possible? No, this is Psalm 51. What is Psalm 51? That's a broken David who's just been confronted by Nathan, and he's broken by the fact that he's committed both adultery and murder. That's David. That is his first prayer of repentance. And when you mess up colossally before the Lord and it hits you, your prayers are often elevated in a, um, you use hyperbole as well. He's not saying, he's not making a doctrinal statement. This is a broken man who's saying, I am totally broken before the Lord. And of course, we know that and we take it that way. If you do believe that he's being literal, then you're in the wrong church. You need to go become Catholic or old school Protestant or something like that. But what am I saying is, I think sometimes we use this, this passage about filthy rags and we use it to just kind of further this idea that we are totally and completely awful. We're just awful people. And I, where am I going with all this? Let me kind of wrap this up. What's the point of tonight's lesson? And here's where we definitely can, we can definitely all agree. We have been redeemed to a Genesis 1 relationship. Sure, we might have been, sure we might have been Genesis 3. And sure, we might have been awful and all these sort of things. But the reason Jesus came was not to keep us in Genesis 3 under that curse but it was to restore us back to Genesis chapter one. That in this world with disciples, with people with the spirit of God, made in the image of God, that are following God, even though we're gonna mess up from time to time, this, this earth is very good again. It's very good. Like we're, he's got his people back here in this thing. And that's an awesome thing. So, you know, I, I think w practically for me, I guess I've, uh, the way I've kind of put it into words is this. Instead of seeing myself as a big, ball of trash that occasionally does some good works. I've tried to flip that a little bit and said, no, wait a second. I'm a disciple. I'm redeemed. I'm a big bunch of good that occasionally messes up. And maybe I'm off on that. And maybe that's, that may, but, but that's really helped me to go, oh, wait a second. It's kind of given me that same confidence. While I don't get to hear the audible voice of God that says, hey, 
This is Ryan with, uh, you know, with you, I am pleased. I'm butchering the passage. You know what I'm talking about, though. Uh, here is my son whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. We, although I didn't get to hear that audible voice, in the scriptures, I do get to hear that over and over again. And so while that probably helped his audience and while that probably helped Jesus, I want it to help us as well. And I'm going to close out by just reading something. I'm going to put it on the screen so you guys can read along. It's just a collection of different scriptures. Who am I in Christ? I am complete in him who is head over, who is head over all rule and authority of every angelic and earthly power, Colossians 2. I am alive with Christ, Ephesians 2. I am free from the law of sin and death, Romans 8. I am far from oppression and will not live in fear, Isaiah 54. I am born of God and the evil one does not touch me, 1 John 5. I am holy and without blame before him in love, Ephesians 1. I have the mind, excuse me, I have the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2. I have the peace of God that surpasses all understanding, Philippians chapter 4. Okay, the spirit of God who is greater than the enemy in the world lives in me, 1 John 4. I've received abundant grace and the gift of righteousness and reign in life through Jesus Christ, Romans 5, 17. I've received the spirit of God and revelation and the knowledge of Jesus, the eyes of my heart enlightened, so that I know the hope of having life in Christ, Ephesians 1. I've received the power of the Holy Spirit, and he can do miraculous things through me. I have authority and power over the enemy in this world, Mark 16. I am renewed in the knowledge of God and no longer want to live in my old ways or nature or ways or nature before I accepted Christ, Colossians 3. I am merciful. I do not judge others and I forgive quickly. As I do this by God's grace, he blesses my life, Luke 6. God supplies all my needs according to his riches in glory in Christ, Philippians 4. In all circumstances, I live by faith in God and extinguish all flaming darts of the enemy, Ephesians 6. I can do whatever I need to do in life through Christ Jesus who gives me strength, Philippians 4.13. I'm chosen by God who called me out of darkness of sin into the light and life of Christ so I can proclaim the excellence and greatness of who he is, 1 Peter chapter 2. I am born again, spiritually transformed, renewed and set apart for God's purpose through the living and everlasting word of God, 1 Peter 1. I am God's workmanship created in Christ to do good works that he has prepared for me to do. I'm a new creation in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5. In Christ, I am dead to sin. My relationship to it is broken, and I'm alive to God, living in unbroken fellowship with him, Romans 6, 11. The light of God's truth has shown in my heart and given me knowledge of salvation through Christ. As I hear God's word, I do what it says, and I'm blessed in my actions. I'm a joint heir with Christ. I'm more than a conqueror through him who loves me. I overcome the enemy of my soul by the blood of the lamb and the word of my testimony. I have everything I need to live in a godly life and am equipped to live in his divine nature. I am an ambassador for Christ. I'm a part of a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a purchased people. I am the righteousness of God. I have right standing with him in Jesus Christ. My body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. I belong to him. I am the head and not the tail, and I only go up uh, go up and not down in life as I trust and obey God. I am the light of the world. I'm chosen by God, forgiven, justified through Christ. I have a compassionate heart, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. I'm redeemed, forgiven of all my sins, and made clean through the blood of Christ. I have, oops, I have been rescued from the domain and the power of darkness and brought into God's kingdom. I'm redeemed from the curse of sin, sickness, and poverty. My life is rooted in my faith in Christ, and I overflow with thanksgiving for all he has done for me. I am called to live a holy life by the grace of God and declare his praises. I am healed and whole in Jesus. I am saved by God's grace, raised up with Christ, and seated with him in the heavenly realms. I'm strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. I humbly submit myself to God, and the devil flees from me because I resist him in the name of of Jesus. I am not ruled by fear because the Holy Spirit lives in me and gives me his power, love, and self-control. Christ in, lives in me, and I live by faith in him and his love for me. I am greatly loved by God.
So guys, we might not get that. We might never get that audible voice of God, of us hearing God say these things, but we have more than enough scriptures to tell that where God shares with us how he really feels about us. And, and in fact, what is it? What are the first words we are going to hear from him when we do make it one day? We're going to hear these words. Well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. Not okay, and I covered up for you. No, no, no. Well done. Good and faithful. Good. Not evil guy, and he's going to pull out some doctrinal thing, and oh, yeah, yeah, you're actually evil. No, no, no. He's going to say, well done. Good. He's going to call you good. He's going to call you faithful. Despite all of our faithlessness, he's going to call us faithful. He's gonna, that's pretty awesome. And so that's how God really feels about you, Mr. Disciple of Jesus Christ.